Lord, there is power in your name. Thank you, Lord, for the power that you provide for us. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. We just ask you, Lord God, to be with us this morning so that we would hear your word this morning, Lord God. I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord of glory, Lord of power, and Lord of wisdom, creator and maker of all things, Lord, we stand in awe of your mercy. Lord, we stand in awe of your grace on our souls, Lord. Though we don't deserve it, Lord, you have poured it out for us on the cross. Lord, we look unto you as our light and our guide, the great and glorious shepherd that gets us through this life. Lord, you revealed yourself um, to this earth as a weak kneed wobbly lamb, Lord, going to that cross, taking my sin away for all eternity, Lord, and I praise you. And Lord, for all that have put your, their faith and trust in you, Lord God, their sin is taken away. But yet, Lord, we sin. Lord, call us to repentance. Lord, call us to that place of deep communion with you, Lord, when we turn our hearts toward you in a greater way. Lord, that we would understand your will and your way for our life. Lord, to be guided by your loving hand. Lord, teach us the fear of the Lord. This morning, that's what we've come to hear about. Lord God, your name is to be revered above all things. Great and glorious is thy name. So Lord, speak to us this morning, Lord, that we would understand in a greater way, Lord, that we would come to a deeper repentance, to a deeper faith in a great and glorious Savior that would come to earth and die for his creation. Lord, bless us this morning with this gift, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord, we do thank and praise you. That, and yet we do sin, but you are so gracious and merciful in forgiveness, forgiving us our sins yes. and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. So we just thank you and praise you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, that you, it is your will, uh, our being sanctified, and we can be more like you. So, Lord, um, help us to taste a new, a fresh, a deeper way. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Lord, that we will be drawn closer to you. And fear and reverence and worship and praise of you will be changed and transformed by you. Thank you for your great and glorious promises. Help us, Lord, to be you in a spirit of worship to magnify the Lord. And let us exalt his name together. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. This morning I have the privilege of reading to you one of the most beautiful psalms in the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 34. You can find that at page 550 in our Pew Bibles. We'll be here in I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. 
The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, and not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Praise the Lord. May God bless the readings of word your soul. May be seated. Wow, as I was listening to that. I was thinking to myself, we're going to deal with verses 1 through 10. Maybe it's like, how do you deal with just verses 1 through 10? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, anyways, that's just, um, as the brother said, just an awesome, awesome um, psalm. Declaring the greatness of God, the glory of God. Um, we're looking at this in the context of uh, a series of messages overcoming worry, fear, and anxiety, and the purpose of it has been to grow in our understanding of the deliverance from fear, worry, anxiety, and stress that the Lord uh, provides for us. So the title is Overcoming Worry and Anxiety, Displacing It, or How to Displace Fear with Faith, or How to Dislodge It. <laughs> How to dislodge fear with fear, you know, fear of life, fear of things that are happening, versus fear of man, versus the fear of God. And the central idea here is God promises to deliver us from all of our fears. And you got your fill in the blanks there, and you see the couple of three little points there. God promises to deliver us from all of our fears. Um, we can exalt the greatness of God in verses 1 through 3. Expect the deliverance of God from our fears in verses 4 through 7. And experience the goodness of God in verses 8 through 10. And 11 through the end of the chapter. Just um, continue to get hold of the point of the fear of the Lord. And the deliverance from the Lord. And the presence of the Lord. So Holy Spirit, just... Continue to move in our midst, Lord. We pray that uh, we will uh, see you. You will be exalted and magnified. We'll see your glory. Really, we'll see your glory uh, in these words. Draw us deeper uh, in you. We pray. Move us in repentance to you. We pray. Touch the hearts of not yet believers. We pray. Touch the hearts of pretenders to the faith, we pray. <clears throat> Touch all of our hearts, Lord, that we would respond with repentance and greater trust and faith in you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So because God promises to deliver us from all of our fears, David begins here exalting the greatness of God there in verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
and let us exalt his name together. Before we get to verse 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Certainly, God's people, we ought to be a people of praise. We ought to be a people of thanksgiving to our great and glorious God. And certainly, we learned this here from uh, David's example. Depending on what uh, the introduction is in your psalm, mine says, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So this is a psalm of deliverance. This is a psalm of David believed to be written on the occasion when God's deliverance was on his hand from the king of Abimelech and when David fled into Gath as he was running um, from Saul. And um, fearful that Saul would kill him, David fled to Gath and sought protection of the enemy of the king here. And, and uh, David would have been an enemy because he was an enemy of the Philistines. And... Um, so he's seeking refuge there, and he offers this um, blessing and praise to the Lord. It says, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. Reminds you of Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will make our boast in the Lord. Um, You know, how we respond to life and how we respond to events. Our soul is either boasting in the Lord or we're boasting in ourself. Um, when we sin, when we respond in sin, we're boasting in ourself. He says here, the humble will hear it and rejoice. So we could ask ourselves a question, as a rule in life or as a regular practice, in life or an habitual practice in life? Are we boasting in the Lord or boasting in self? He says the humble will hear it when we boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Um, so that's the call for right and proper boasting, boasting in the Lord, magnifying the Lord, exalting the Lord. It's it's not just it's more than just our words and our deeds. It's our it's mostly our actions and reactions and interactions. Remember what it says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on all the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. The Lord delights in those who know him, those who understand him, those who exercise. I know him as the one who exercises his loving kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth. So he says here, oh, it's a song, it's a hymn, right? It's a hymn, it's a hymn or a chorus, or it's probably both, oh, magnify, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I like that. Magnifying. Um, not that we make God look bigger than he is. We right? can't magnify him in that sense, but we magnify him in the sense of God who seems, you know, like my illustration that I do sometimes, like, like here's John Stephen, here's people in the pews, all of us as children of God. And we're going through life and how we react and interact and respond to life reveals how we view God. And sometimes we're like, there he is. He's like really down there. It's a little teeny, like tiny, tiny, like, like even smaller than a little speck on the carpet. Right? And I know when I'm like that, it's because Puffed up like the incredible Hulk full of uh, self. Magnify the Lord. Who do you magnify in life? Who do you magnify in the Lord or magnify itself? It's hard to take refuge in the Lord when you're magnifying self. That's what the psalmist is telling us to do here. When we take refuge in the Lord, 
or boasting or magnifying in the Lord, when we take refuge in self, or boasting in our magnifying self. But I love this verse. I love, you see that? Look at verse 3 again. We'll magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Mm-hmm. You see that? You see the exalting and magnifying the Lord has a corporate, communal aspect to it. Amen. Right? The body of Christ exalting the Lord together in worship and praise. The body of Christ exalting the Lord together in missions and reaching out to the community. The body of Christ exalting the Lord together in ministering to the needs of people, helping people to see the love of Jesus, and ministering to the whole person and ministering to them that they would know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. That's magnifying the Lord with me, exalting His name together. That's a beautiful thought there. So it's beautiful when the local visible church is making beautiful music together like that, Amen. so to speak. Puts to remember in Psalm 29, verses 1, and just four, 1 through 2, but the whole, the whole psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. So, God promises to deliver us from all of our fears. David begins here by exalting the greatness of God in the midst of his life, right? Then we look at the next thought here, is if we can expect the deliverance of God here from fear. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, or he heard my cry, and delivered me from all my fears. Remember we've said this a couple of, quite a few times now, it was at least 365 times in the Bible at least where it says fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? Because we are people prone to fear. And every time, most of the times when it says fear not, it's, it gives you the reason not to fear. Fear not because God is with you. Fear not because God will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Fear not because God is present. Fear not because God is all knowing. Fear not be or not. And then at the same time, the Bible tells us something that we ought to fear. Right? That's what we're starting to look at here. Fearing the Lord, as it says down here in verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. So I sought the Lord and he answered me. <laughs> so in the midst of worry, fear, anxiety, where do we turn? So we see what happens when we turn to the Lord in a moment by moment continual basis. He says he delivers us from all of our fears. There's lots of things to fear in life. Fear of getting sick of cancer. Fear of health failing. Fear of trials and difficulties that we're facing in life. Fear of the fear of all and sometimes the decisions that we have to make in life. And we're reminded here where we need to turn to the one who delivers us from our fears. Um, the, the word fears there, when the psalmist speaks, he speaks of the, these things. He speaks of those concerns that terrorize the, the soul, terrorize the mind, occupy one's thoughts. These fears pertain to the poor experiences of life as well as the dread of the unknown. And it says uh, here in the scripture what we ought to dread and what we ought to fear, right? Offending our God. All right, let me look. Let me see. Do we have any verse 5 Christians out here? We might, we might have some here right now because we're in church and so it's, it's a great place to be on Sunday. Are there any no, first five Christians in the house? What's verse five say? <laughs> they looked to him and were radiant. <laughs> radiant. And their faces will never be ashamed. Radiant. I love like that. And the original radiant means brightened. It means expressing joy, opposed to the downcast features 
of those who are ashamed or disappointed or the downcast features of those caught up in the, in the things of life and in the circumstances of life and in those moments the focus is on self and not on the Lord. A radiant Christian reminds me of, remember I gave this illustration before, of um, Robert Murray McShane, the Scottish preacher who was known to just radiate the glory and the presence of Christ so much so that the story is told that when he would walk around his parish and minister to the different people around him, that sometimes people would just fall on their face in repentance and faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Just He was called Mr. Glory Face. I don't have any Mr. Glory Faces out here. We look to Him. As we look to Him, we become that. As we look to Him, uh, we become radiant like this. Uh, shining as a light. Not your physical features, but what we look like spiritually. So where we look, the point of this is where we look has a tremendous effect upon our countenance. Countenance. Verses 6 and 7 say, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles, and that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues him. Lord saves us out of all of our troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescue him. So we can expect the deliverance of God from our fears. Next one, we can, ex we can experience the goodness of God. This is a, a, a chorus as well. I don't know why I keep clicking for it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So I guess we could say, or the original the word taste means to evaluate with a view of uh, consuming. And then the word see means to enjoy, to look at fully. So the Christian life is a taste and see life. The more we taste, the more we see the Lord, the more our hunger and desire for the Lord increases. That's why when people, when if you want to call someone's a backsliding and they're drifting away from the Lord, and it can be a subtle, subtle, subtle. Remember hearing the sermon about that? How that drifting away is a subtle drifting, and sometimes it's slow. It's a slow fade. In fact, that's that song by Casting Crowns. And um, there's uh, a disobedience to God's word. And there's a, a compromise, and the drifting just goes a little further, and the acceptance of sin in the life of the believer just becomes even greater. And it reminds me of the illustration where um, Charles Stanley was on a summer vacation with his kids, and he told his son, Andy, and I forget the daughter's name, but when you're in the water, there's a strong undertow, there's a strong current. And you could get pulled away. And you could get pulled under. You could get pulled away. And he goes, but like behind him, there were like two, I don't know, posts or something. Some markers were behind him. Kind of like behind where they were camped out on the beach. And he would say, okay, just make sure you're within the, there'd be one over here and one over there. So just make sure you're, if you see yourself going too far one way or the other, kind of alter your course and get back to where you're between those two markers. How much that is like us as children of God, right? It's a slow drifting. And then there's not so much a tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord that's going on there in the life of the, any one of us or the believer in Christ, right? As the drifting goes, and then there's not so much a hunger and an appetite for God's word as there was before. Piper wrote that great, great, wonderful book, Desiring God. And then he also read another book that we don't talk about too much. It's called, What Do I Do When I Don't Desire God? That's actually in the, I actually have that. We'll have both of them um, in my library. There's, I think there's a copy of both in the church library. What happens when I don't desire God? Then what do I do? So what's a taste and see? Our failure to taste and see the Lord for to believe will result in a weakened, defeated 
Christian life. So we're exhorted, hopefully we're regularly tasting and seeing. What are we tasting and seeing? The Lord is good. We're tasting and seeing who He is. We're tasting and seeing who He is, who we are in the light of His glorious presence. That's why the importance of our reading the Word. There's three imperatives here. Taste, see, and fear. And um, taste and see and um, fear are all in the imperative and they're all complementary in that sense. He says, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Blessed. Bliss. Means like bliss. Um, to take refuge in him means to trust in him, right? Actually, when John was reading that, where, where, he was further down. Hold on, let's see. Uh, well, the, the, the point of, oh yeah, it's, it's, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's, it's in verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want or in any good th or of any good thing. And when John was reading that, we were just looking at Isaiah 40, 31 downstairs in the adult Sunday school class. I thought, wow, that sounds so much like that. But those who wait and trust on the Lord will renew their strength. Right? And the analogy here about young lions not lacking. Um, young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord should not be in want of any good thing. Blissful. Blessed is the man. It is a blissful life, a blessed life, for those who take refuge in the Lord. Remember this, okay, in the context of worry, fear, anxiety, and stress have really no place in the Christian life. That's why that chorus that we were singing about breaking every chain was important. But that worry, fear, anxiety, and stress can give way to radiance. Radiance. Trust. Spurgeon said, we must taste that he is a bountiful benefactor, relish the goodness of God and all his gifts to us, and reckon that the Savior and sweetness of them. Let's let God's goodness be rolled under the tongue as a sweet morsel. Like, you know, we all like your favorite meals and taste and see the Lord, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. That's what the, the, the that's what we're supposed to do. The pastors and preachers are supposed to do and they're sharing the words is putting out forth there a, 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 a banquet of uh, delight in the Lord. Which leads to an increased appetite for more. So he says here in verse 9, Fear the Lord, you, his saints. So we can exper we're experiencing the goodness of God here in these verses, right? He says, Fear the Lord, you, his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. That makes you think of, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The Lord is my shepherd, actually. I shall not want. Fear the Lord. So you see who's called to fear the Lord here. The saints, it's church, two believers. <laughs> I had a Christian friend one time who said to me, John, he goes, if there's anything in this life that will keep you from sin, you know how we keep doing the very thing we hate, blah, 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 from Romans chapter 7, is the fear of the Lord. The fear of offending the Lord. The fear of offending Him. Oh, fear of the Lord, His saints, so that's the fear that will keep us from sinning against the Holy God. And I remember as an early newborn Christian, way back then, I remember how blatant there were certain things that I was doing when the Lord saved me. And I'm like, I can't watch that anymore. I can't do that anymore. I don't want to participate with this. And it was obvious things. Those were easy. To me, those were somewhat easy. Way easier than even the things now that you struggle with as you're growing in Christ and He's molding and shaping and changing and refining and, and, you, and, you, and you're seeing things in yourself that you never saw before. And if you have young children at my age, you see things in your life that you never saw before. You're like, what is that in there? 
But I remember being actually, and actually I even remember, so I remember early on, stop this, stop that, stop this, I don't want this, I'm not going to do this anymore. And people where I used to work just going, like, what happened? What's going on? What is it with you? And I'd be like, well, no, you know, the Lord saved me, and so I'm not, I don't have a desire for that and that anymore. And they're like, whoa, what happened? And <clears throat> those things were easier somewhat, way, by comparison to, you know, the the deeper things that the Lord wants to do and work in you. And I remember even as an unsaved man, having a hope, having a respect and a reverence for God and the holiness of God. And how now as unsaved man, you know, you would do whatever kind of what you'd want to do and you would I I, I, I still was sitting. But I remember certain particular things, I'm like, I ain't doing that. No, I'm not going there. Because God is holy and God is just. And I and there were certain particular, and I was still not, I'm not a Christian, but there were certain things I had fear of God about that I'm like, nope, nope. And that, and that kept me from certain things. So there's the point. That's even as an unbeliever. How much more now we as believers in Christ, having the right and holy reverence and fear of the Lord and the fear of offending Him, and then when we do, we just are quick on our knees and confession and repentance and asking the Lord to strengthen us and asking the Lord to fill us with his spirit. So for those, it says here, who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do like and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. So there's no, there's uh, no fear for those. There's no there's no fear. For those who fear him, there is no want. What? That's a great and glorious promise right there. For those who fear him, there is no want. Have our sufficiency in him. Right? So, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's the greatness of God. Let's exalt the greatness of God. Let's expect the deliverance from God of God from our fears. Let's experience more and more the goodness of God and taking refuge in Him. So let's like, start to apply it a little bit. And as I say this sometimes, as you think about the passage later today or during the week, I mean, Psalm 34 is just like, that's another one of those, that's like an awesome chapter in the Bible, like Brother John had said. And as you read and think about it, if you taste and see some of the goodness of the Lord during the week, text me or email me or and it's like, wow, that's, I see how that applies this way and that way. And it's like, I'm just pointing out a couple things that the Lord showed me as I'm studying. Now. I get to look at it for the whole week. Okay, the first one is, the first applying is we need to, to run from sin and turn to the Lord in obedience. It's like, run like, like, like Joseph ran, right? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That goes with trust. It. I quoted this last week. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge me and I'll make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It'll be healing to your body and strength to your soul. Run. Especially if you're like You've been drifting, and now all of a sudden, now you're like over here somewhere, and God is pointing out and reminding you that you're over here somewhere, and He's like calling you back to Himself in repentance and faith. Amen. Be quick to do it, because then the heart, the otherwise the heart gets hardened, hardened, hardened. And there's some that have just done this right to the point of. Being unsaved, not that they've lost, not that they lost their salvation, but that their life is not have giving any evidence that they are saved, and they turn and turn and turn away and are just way up, and it's like there's no evidence that they belong, they even belong to him at this point. But if they hear the call and they heed the call, the evidence that they belong to him will be shown in their repenting right from the, that, that moment, turning to him and running toward him. In repentance. Proverbs 16, 6 says, By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. 
And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. So that would be a great prayer. That would be a great prayer for us as we're wanting to be molded and sanctified and changed in the image and likeness of Christ. And, 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 you're, and you're dealing with your Romans 7, this very things you hate and stuff. And you're like, God, please give me a, a, a greater fear and a reverence for you, a greater appreciation of you that it would keep me from the presumptuous sins. Psalm is saying we're saying that. Keep me, hold me back from this. So just spend an hour, just spend time in prayer. God, help me to have that right. Not like, I'm not talking about, I say this, I'm not talking about the, the, the you know, the cowering, you know, fear, but just the kind of fear that's just like looking up to God and saying, wow, God, look at all you, who you are. Look what I've done. Look what you've done for me. And I just worship you. I want to magnify you. I want to exalt you. I just love you. Help me. Keep me back from sin. Help me. Help me to have a right reverential fear for you in the midst of whatever it is that I'm dealing with Amen. or struggling with on a regular basis. Run from, run from sin and turn to the Lord in obedience. Then I found another one. I don't want to say to you what it is before I just start reading it to you. But it's Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have, you, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? Verse 9 says, You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so there may be food in my house. And test me now with this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessings until it overflows. Next one. There's a right fear in fearing the Lord. So there's a right fear in fearing the Lord. This is for the unsaved person. This is for the not yet believer. This is the one who's drifted so far away that are, are, are they or are they not a Christian is now even in question. Not that they've lost their salvation, but habitual living in disobedience and sin to the living God a believer in Christ cannot stay there. I'm just telling you. A believer in Christ cannot stay there. Amen. Cannot stay there. That's just like who God is. I'll never let, I'll never let them get snatched out of my hand. Mm -hmm. They cannot. And when they hear the... I remember talking to somebody one time who was a believer in Christ and they were living in a particular way and I won't go into any of the details and I'm, I'm, I just shared God's word with the person and they're like, oh. I go, well, what do you think you need to do? I need to stop that and repent and turn to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I won't say what it was because it might hit home with somebody. <clears throat> but they said, I know that's wrong. Oh, I actually, the person saying, I didn't know that was wrong, they're saying at first. Oh, God's word is saying that. Okay, I need to stop that and repent and turn to the Lord. Do not fear, so this is really for the un okay. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. There's a right fear in fearing the Lord here. And people, we could, we could fear a lot of different things, but the, the greatest thing we ought to fear is the Lord, and the unsaved person ought to fear the Lord and the judgment from sin that awaits them if they don't turn to Christ and repentance and faith to be saved. And next week maybe we might talk about how we don't have to fear death. Believers in Christ don't have to fear death. Okay, next one. Next one is what? We need to grow in the fear of the Lord? That's right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. How true is that? The fear of the Lord Hallelujah. is the beginning of wisdom. Yes, it is. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
I find that a little bit encouraging. Yeah. A lot of it encouraging. Um, fear of the Lord. Right? It's the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. They reject it. They reject it. And what was Proverbs 1, 7? Amen. Amen. All right, so to, um, all right, let me read a couple other verses as it relates to that. Proverbs 9, 10, okay? Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9, 10. Job 28, 28. I'll skip Job 28, 28. I'm just going to do 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Check this one out. Check in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these beloved promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. We can take that one. So just... When we talk about claiming the promises of God, we don't mean like name it and claim it for the for the financial ter- uh, uh, Mercedes, you know, all those types of blessings, but claiming and standing on the promises of God and praying them, Lord, cleanse me from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Perfect me in holiness in fear of God. Okay, let's repent. Uh, next one is Let's repent of fearing man and instead fear the Lord. We touched on this last week. The Lord is my the Lord Amen. is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Fear and dread kind of go together there. So I remind, I'm reminded here of the Lord, the Lord, our light and salvation, the Lord, the defense of my life. Whom shall I fear? That's a, so, that's a hammer, of course. Whom shall I dread? Every time I hear the word dread, I think of lurch, but I won't do that. I won't do that. <laughs> Impersonation. I have other verses for this, but I'm just going to read Acts 9, verse 31. Um, for sake of time, Acts 9, 31. Check this out. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up. That's cool. And going on in the fear of the Lord. And going on in the fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So there's a church growth. <laughs> There's a church growth movement right there. Three things there. Church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Well, four things there. They enjoyed peace. There's actually four things there. They enjoyed peace. There was harmony in the body. Uh, Psalm 133 talks about how beautiful it is when brothers dwell together in harmony, in unity. There was peace. They were being built up in the Word being taught and instructed in the Word, and they're going on from that in the fear and reverence of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, it says, it, being the church, continued to increase. Continued to increase. So we need to repent of fearing man, you know, what this one thinks of me. I mean, I, I don't mean like, you know, in a bad way, but I mean in a good way, you know, the opinions of other people. Um, Set fear of the Lord. Don't fear man. Jesus gives us the ultimate antidote and anti-anxiety treatment. <laughs> Jesus gives us the ultimate antidote and anti-anxiety treatment. Help us to do this, Lord. Help me to do this, Lord. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen. And all these things, what are the things? It's all the other things in Matthew chapter 6, the all other things of life that we need. And 
sometimes are sources of anxiety, worry, and stress. All these other things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's probably one of the most quoted verses might be Matthew 6, 34. Jesus gives us that antidote, that anti-anxiety treatment. Seeking first his kingdom, trusting in him. Oh, help us to do that. I added one, Dan. I don't think you have this one. Let's ask the Lord to increase our appetite for him. No, you don't. All right, really quick. Let's ask the Lord to increase our appetite for him. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sounds to me like 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure birth of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So that verse 3 is important. It follows this. So it says, like newborn babies, long for the pure birth of the word, by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, Peter said, or that's actually verse 18, says, but grow in the grace and knowledge, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in respect to your salvation. And a person who does and will grow in the respect to their salvation, according to verse 3, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. If you have truly tasted the goodness of the Lord of the Lord. The word tasted there we talked about earlier means to experience, to enjoy. For some, Christ is sweet and appetizing. For others, he's bland or, or bitter and they don't want anything to do with him. Is Jesus someone who excites your appetite? I mean, you know, we can be honest. There's times when he does excite our appetite, and then there's other times when, you know, um, our, the stuff of life is uh, crowding in and crashing in on us, but that's the time when we got to go after him even more. Do your taste buds desire to enjoy more of him? Do you see it? If you've tasted it, tasted him, the taste excites the appetite. Taste excites the appetite. All right, just before we close, yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, actually, I can't do this because it would take too long to go into 11 through 22. But we could look at verse 11 just by way of closure. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It's something we have to learn. Verse 12 says, Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? These are application points here of tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord, taking a refuge in Him, exalting the Lord, magnifying Him. Verse 13 is an application. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil. Turn from evil. Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Amen. Or like verse 15 says, having the right kind of fear, the fear of God. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and His ears are open to their cries. So that's cool. The Lord's eyes are toward the righteous. He cares and is concerned about the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. And at the same time, his eyes see. I, I think I told you that one time Cheryl wasn't home. This is before there were six of them. There might have only been a couple of them at that point. And um, I said something. Or I responded in some way to them. And I was like, Okay, nobody saw that. Nobody heard that. Cheryl's not, that's right, Cheryl's at work. God sees everything. Mm -hmm. Fear him. Right? Fear him. And then the warning, the face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. I can't keep going, but verse 17, the righteous cry, the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. All right. Foundational question. How is God inviting us to respond to his promise of deliverance from all of our fears? 
How is he inviting us to respond to his promise of deliverance from all his fears? Or we could say something like, as we've tasted and as we see the goodness of God, and as we see how he delivers us from fear, and as we see his goodness and his glory and his loving kindness, how are we to respond to the glory that we see of God in these verses and in this passage? The, the glory that he is among us, the glory of his presence, the glory of the invitation to taste and see his goodness, the glory of the invitation to turn to him to be delivered from all of our fears. Okay, we're ending. Verse 4 and 5. And two other verses. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him, and were radiant. And their faces will never be ashamed. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence from where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you, he who keeps you will not slumber. Actually, you've got to read the whole psalm. I don't have time, but read the whole psalm. <laughs> how he's your keeper, how he's your shade, how he's your protector, how he guards you. Look up, look up, look up. We're so naturally prone to look down, look inward, look around us, mm. and look at others. I mean, I, we know keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So thank you, Lord, that we can seek you and the promise that you have for delivering us from all our fears. So that's where I mean when we see we need to claim, in the right way, claim, appropriate, incorporate <laughs> the promises of God into our life on a regular basis. And that comes from being in the Word, being in prayer. Seeking his presence. One last verse. And then the quote for the week that I forgot to send Dan, I'll, I'll end with the quote. But the last verse is Isaiah 33, 6. Actually, we're going to end with that. Let me read the quote. Edward T. Welsh in his book, Running Scared, right? He's talking about fear of God instead of fear of man. He said, fear still reveals our allegiances. But this time in a positive way. When we're fearful over man, over something else, it reveals what our allegiance is. Or what we fear, we try to control. But he says, if we have a mature fear of the Lord, it means that we value and revere Him above all else. He says, that's how we fight fear with fear. Isaiah 33, 6 says, And he will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. I've never saw this before. You ready? Isaiah 33, 6. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Mm. Amen. Oh Amen. Lord, may that just be... Amen. As the brother says, we can swim in the ocean of that. We can swim in the ocean of Psalm 34. But the fear of the Lord will be our treasure. I think of those verses in Matthew about the treasure and seeking it out and, and, and going and selling everything they had and to find that treasure or find that pearl of great value, of great price. And your word says the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Help us to have that kind of reverence fear of the Lord, that we would treasure, that he would be the ulcer, that's the whole point there, again, that he would be the all-surpassing value, the all-surpassing treasure of our life, that we wouldn't fear all this other stuff that we fear, or people that we fear, that we wouldn't fear any of that other stuff, that it would be dislodged, be displaced by Christ, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.